Hi everyone, we are going to go over the rest of the methodology lecture for social psychology. This is chapter two and <clears throat> in class we covered uh, observational method and correlational method and this is pretty much where we left off in class and so I'm just going to finish this out talking about experimental method and some important concepts in terms that you'll need to know just about methodology in general that's used by social psychologists. So because I have some links in here and some videos and some scenarios that I want you guys to consider, what I'm going to do is I'll kind of pause for a minute and I want you to pause the video, read or watch whatever it may be, and then I'll come back to it and we'll talk about it basically. So um, so even though, you know, this lecture might be, you know, however many minutes really account for the fact that you'll be doing a little bit of thinking exercises and you might also be watching videos in the middle of this lecture. So we talked about correlation and we talked about the fact that the correlational method looks at the relationship between two variables and it's looking at how they change systematically. So, you know, as one increases, as one variable may increase, the other one may decrease, and that would be a negative relationship. And as one variable increases, the other one increases would be a positive relationship. And if there's no uh, relationship between the two, then we'll see a very scattered sort of, if we're looking at a scatter plot, very scattered points and a pretty horizontal line. And so that's just, you know, a little bit of a recap. I also have a video loaded on Moodle from a different class, but it goes into correlation method pretty uh, extensively with some very good uh, examples. Uh, and I've drawn them out as well so you can kind of see how it works. And so if you need a recap of the correlation method, I suggest that you take a look at the uh, video I, I um, uploaded, I believe, for adolescent development. So <clears throat> when we consider correlation method, uh, here is an example where there was a correlation found between the type of birth control that women used and their likelihood of getting an STD or STI, a sexually transmitted disease or sexually transmitted infection. And so if you look at the relationship, it turns out that those uh, partners who used condoms, um, you know, you could argue were more likely to have an STD uh, than were women who used other forms of birth control. Um, and so, you know, that if, if that was the result, that there was a correlation between uh, birth control type, likelihood of getting an STD, and if they were positively correlated with, you know, um, the more likely a woman is using uh, birth control, the more likely she's getting an STD, um, that's, you know, the, the first inclination is, is, oh, if you use condoms and, you know, you're going to, or if you use birth control then like condoms, then you're going to be more likely to um, use uh, than than to have STDs. And so, um, you know, you the the surface argument is that the use of condoms uh, caused the increase in STDs. And if you know you know anything about uh, protected sex and STD rates, then you know that that's probably not it's what's happening. And so you can't derive or can't say that this was a causal thing because there was no manipulation. It's just an observation type um, uh, situation where you're getting information from both variables. So for example, if we say um, that a woman who is using condoms or a, you know, a partner is using condoms, it's very possible that the condom users were much more likely to have had sex with multiple partners in previous months. So they're more likely to have STDs or STIs just because of the rate at which that they are um, having sex. And it could be that um, another explanation is that it could be that the partners of women who, who were using condoms were more likely to actually have STDs than uh, those women who were using something like sponges and diaphragms. And so, you know, by saying, okay, you know, if, if you have a particular relationship and you're trying to explain that relationship with correlation, correlation does a really good job of saying these two things are related in some way, but it doesn't do a great job of saying exactly how those things are related uh, in, in, 
causal way. So if we look at another relationship here, for example, the relationship between TV violence and aggression, we know that those are correlated. We know that um, children who are more likely, uh, children who watch more TV violence uh, also seem to uh, be more likely to be, be aggressive and have aggressive actions. And there's three potential explanations for this kind of relationship. So if you say that uh, watching violent TV makes you more aggressive, that, that doesn't, it, it's not something that we can say definitively with a correlation. It is a possibility that watching more uh, violent TV or playing violent video games can cause a, a viewer to become more violent. It could be that the aggressiveness is first and that uh, kids who are more aggressive tend to seek out and watch violent TV. Uh, and so it's the aggressiveness that actually increases the, the violent TV watching. And then a third potential explanation is that there's some other var variable that can explain both of those things. And it's affecting, it could be um, mitigating, it could be manipulating the other variables. And so <clears throat> we can see here that, for example, uh, parental neglect, if the parent isn't monitoring the TV use, isn't monitoring what the child is watching, or if the parent themselves are watching violent TV and the, and the child is just simply um, used to watching that sort of thing, that could cause uh, both the TV watching and aggression because perhaps the parent is aggressive themselves. It could be um, a hereditary type thing that, or an environmental type thing where the child's exposed to violence, not only on TV, but also um, in their home life situation. So um, correlation is, is really great at showing us relationships, but it's not really good at saying what's causing the change, what's causing that systematic change. So I'm going to give you guys a few examples here. And what I want you to do is to think about the correlation and think about why it is that these relationships could exist. So what are some alternative explanations? So I'm going to show you the first one. And this one is about helicopter parents. So I'm going to give you a second to read it. I want you to pause the video. And then I want you to jot down um, maybe a couple of alternative explanations as to why it's not absolutely obvious for this particular relationship. Okay, so hopefully you've unpaused it. You got a chance to read it and got a chance to think about it. So something that you can think about is it could be that, um, you know, the helicopter parents are keeping really close track uh, of their kids um, because they need to because maybe the kids were having academic problems before and they are monitoring um, them more closely because maybe they have a learning disability, maybe they you know, need to have an advocate because they've had academic issues in the past. So a lot of people think that, um, you know, kids who have helicopter parents, um, that the, the parents decide to be that way as soon as the kid is young and, and, or at birth and the parent follows along with them. And it could be that, you know, if the parents just backed off, that the kid can actually breathe and actually, you know, do well. But, and that's kind of the, the obvious choice and the obvious argument. But it could be that there are situations where the uh, parent has become like, you know, much more closely monitoring because of an issue with the child. Um, so, you know, there are potential third variables that could explain why uh, parents hover over their children. Um, and I'm sure we can probably think of, of several different kinds of examples. So I'm going to give you guys another example here about um, how uh, children drink milk and the relationship between weight. So I'm going to give you guys a second to read it and pause this and think of a few alternative explanations. So looking at this particular example, the first thing you conclude is, oh, if you drink more milk, then you're going to be heavier. Uh, you're going to weigh more. And so um, you would think a, a logical conclusion is, is that if a child 
weighs too much, if they're too high on the percentile, if they're uh, uh, considered obese, or if they're, um, you know, not um, growing properly in terms of their height and weight uh, ratio, then the obvious solution is to say, well, cut out anything that's high fat. And one thing that's high fat that children drink is, is whole milk. So you might say, okay, um, <clears throat> since there's a relationship here, don't drink whole milk. But the problem here is that it could not necessarily be just the milk itself. So it could be that children who are drinking more milk are more likely to be eating cookies with the milk, um, especially if they don't particularly love drinking milk and the parent sort of uh, uses other things to kind of force them to drink it, like saying, oh, I'll give you three Oreos if you if you finish your milk. Um, it could be that they are getting other uh, high calorie foods in there in other places and it just so happens that they're consuming more just in general um, and it just so happens that it's more milk that's in the mix with all the other uh, large quantities of food that they're consuming. So just because a child is drinking more milk and, and, and is gaining more weight doesn't necessarily mean that the milk itself is what's causing it. The only way to really test this to say for sure, is to actually manipulate the amount of milk that uh, groups of children get and say, okay, well, you know, this group will get no milk, this group will get, you know, X amount of milk, this group will get more milk, and so forth and so on. And now what we've done is we've moved on to the experimental method. So this is where we, a researcher would take a group of participants, they would assign them randomly to different conditions, um, and one, you know, more uh, advanced, very large studies will have many manipulations, but you know the idea, we're going to keep this simple, is to have one manipulation, uh, one independent variable that we change, that we expect to have some causal effect on a person's behavior. And so for in the example of the milk with the correlation, if we wanted to test that correlation and say, well, we want to know the cause and effect relationship, then we would move that to an experimental method. And then we would put children in different groups and say, okay, well, this group, we're going to have drink no milk, which is what we consider our control. And then this milk, this group will have, you know, one glass of milk a day. This group will have two glasses of milk a day. This group will have three glasses of milk a day, so forth and so on. And randomly put children in each of these groups. And then at that point, we can actually answer a causal question. We can say, the amount of milk that's changed is actually influencing weight. And then in that case, we can say that milk consumption is affecting weight. So remember that the observational method helps us describe social behavior. It's really good at description. Correlation method helps us look at what kinds of behaviors, social behaviors specifically, are related, and how they're related in terms of in a systematic way. Are they positively or negatively related? But the only method that we can use to answer causal questions is the experimental method. And so we're going to go over a few terms here um, <clears throat> with the experimental method. So we have the independent variable. And the independent variable is independent of everything. It's what we manipulate. It's what we change. And this is what we're interested in in terms of looking at our question. So, for example, if we were interested in the kinds of, of TV shows that children watch, okay, uh, we perhaps would say, well, let's manipulate the kinds of shows that a group of children are going to watch. So we'll have one group watch a very violent TV show, and we'll have another group watch Sesame Street. The dependent variable is what's measured. This is the behavior that's measured to see if it is impacted or affected by the independent variable. It's dependent upon the change. It's dependent upon the independent variable. And so in this case... In this example, if we were changing, manipulating the type of TV show, so for example, an aggressive show or a violent show, I should say, versus Sesame Street, we would need some behavioral measure to see what's going on, what's changing. And so in this case, we might want to see um, what aggressive responses do the children have? Like how many uh, aggressive actions does a, does a child have? And does it change based off of the TV show that they watched? So the measure that you're measuring, the dependent variable, is aggression. And the dependent variable is what 
you expect to change based off of your manipulation. So is the TV show violent or nonviolent? And how many aggressive responses um, do the children uh, do based off of the show that they've watched? Now, I'm going to pause again here for you guys to watch this. It's a rather short video about the death of Kitty Genovese. Now, Kitty Genovese, we talked a little bit about in class. Um, this is the case where we discovered the bystander effect. And it spurred some work um, from uh, Latine and Darley that really changed the, the um, pace of, of social psychology. It, it provided us a lot of really great information. Um, so watch the video fully. The, the beginning part will kind of show how Latine and Darley uh, used a real life event to think of uh, some experiments to test what happened here. So Latine and Darley as the researchers could say, oh wow, this hor horrific event where this woman was killed. Um, wow, you know, people, people are awful. That's bad. People, nobody called the police. Nobody did anything. And you could argue that people are, you know, um, not helpful and just leave it at that and say, oh gosh, that's just awful. Or you could say, hey, let's expand on this and let's see if we can learn why people didn't help. And so that's where, where Latney and Darley's research comes in, where they took a real life, a real event, and then they were inspired to do research on that. And so <clears throat> um, I'm going to pause real quick. Pause this video, go ahead and go to the YouTube video and watch that all the way through because the end is important where you actually see clips of Latin and Darley's actual experiments. And we're going to talk about that in terms of the experimental method. Okay, so hopefully you got a chance to watch the whole video. And here we're going to talk about uh, what Latin and Darley did. Um, and so this... When, when I'm talking about this throughout this lecture, I want you to think about the study that they did with not the smoke in the room, but the study where uh, the groups of people were listening in and somebody had a seizure, because that's what we're going to talk about in terms of this example. So if you recall from the video, um, they changed uh, different groups of people in terms of how many were participating in the study, and then... They were looking at, uh, they had a recording of somebody who was uh, pretending, They didn't, the participants didn't know this, but it's pretending to have an emergency. And in this case, the emergency was the person was, was um, having a seizure. And so they wanted, uh, Latin and Darley were interested in how many people stopped what they were doing, stopped the experiment, and went and got help for that person on the other end um, of the, of the, um, the headset. Because... Excuse me, remember that they couldn't actually see the person who was in trouble. They were just listening. They didn't know this. They were listening to a recording, but they thought that they were listening to the person on the other end. So the independent variable is what was controlled, what was manipulated, and what was changed. And so in this case, they, Latney and Darley were most interested in how big of a group do you need in order for the bystander effect to occur? So they wanted to create an emergency situation and they wanted to see, well, if one person heard this emergency situation and needed to get help, would they get help? What happens if you have two people there? What three people, four people, and so on. So what they changed in their experiment was the number of bystanders. They changed the number of groups of people that were present who were uh, witnessing the emergency. And what they were interested in finding was how many people sought out and got help. So the independent variable was the number of bystanders that they manipulated, the groups. And then the dependent variable, what was measured was the number of people who went and got help. So staging this experiment, you know, was rather difficult. It's not a super easy thing to do because you have to create an emergency that's believable, but also not necessarily traumatic. And so they needed to make sure, of course, that they had a believable emergency. And in this case, they actually picked, um, you know, a person having a seizure. That was something that wasn't necessarily, uh, I guess, overly traumatic, um, but something that would elicit um, 
some behavior that would require uh, a person to get help. Okay, so <clears throat> the independent variable, right, and the dependent variable we covered. So the independent variable is all about what, uh, how many groups of helpers, of bystanders, and the dependent variable was how many people actually helped, how many people went through and need and, 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 and said, I'm stopping this experiment and I'm going and helping. So if you look at this particular um, results, you'll see that if there is one victim and one participant, so here what was manipulated is the only person that witnessed the emergency was the participant. And in that case, almost everybody, nearly everyone, 85% of the, of the participants helped. So 85% of them heard something going on, stopped what they were doing, and went and got help and said, hey, somebody needs help. <clears throat> when they had a participant with two other people who were on the line, the participant only helped 62% of the time. So this is where we're actually seeing a very big drop. You just add a few more people to the situation and you're going to be more likely to get the bystander effect because we can argue why is this? Oh, well, perhaps, you know, the person felt like the two other people, somebody else was going to help. Maybe they were unsure. Uh, you know, as you add more people, the chance of the participant helping decreases. So you can see here on the third section here, when you add four other people in the mix, only 31% of the participants actually help. And the more you increase these groups, the higher the chance of the bystander effect, the lower the chance the participants actually helping. And you can say that the number of group people in the group actually causes the participant to be less or more likely to help because you manipulated this particular scenario. So this is something that you can actually say is a causal relationship. The more people you add, the less likely a person will help. The more likely you're going to see the bystander effect. Now, you have to be careful with experimental studies because you want to make sure that the independent variable is the only thing that's affecting the dependent variable. So the study must have internal validity. It must be a valid study. You must be measuring what you say you're measuring and that the independent variable, the manipulation, is indeed affecting your measurement, your dependent variable. Now, the one thing you can do, of course, is to control extraneous variables. This is difficult to do, but it's something that 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 is, you know, wealth a well thought out study will do well. So, a way to make sure that the study had high internal validity and to make sure that they're controlling extraneous variables so that nothing else is going to influence the behavior other than the manipulation. Latin and Darley were very careful to make sure that everyone witnessed the same emergency. So they recorded the pretend emergency for everyone to hear. So everyone got the same time that they heard it, the same duration of the uh, um, emergency, the same tone, the same sense of urgency. All of that was maintained in terms of being controlled. So these pre-recorded responses were played over the intercom system. And so everyone was exposed in every group to the same emergency. So that's one way that they control those extraneous variables. Because you could argue, well, if you did it different every time, you know, there are some cases where a person might uh, be bored, right? They might be pretending that they're having the seizure and that would be non-convincing. In that case, that can affect if a person's going to help. If they're like, oh, I don't feel well, uh, you know, then the, then the participant might go, well, oh, they don't sound like they're in trouble at all. But the, because this was pre-recorded and because this was con controlled the whole time uh, e over each scenario in each group and each trial, 
we know that that was um, controlled for in the experiment. Another thing that you can do to maintain um, high internal validity is to make sure that you randomly assign people to experimental conditions. This makes sure that it distributes all kinds of participants across the different conditions. And this reduces bias. This is a really big idea here, this idea of bias. So let's say you have a group of, uh, of 20 people that they're testing just over the course of different groups, different trials. And let's say out of those 20 people, let's say five of them are experienced with epilepsy and seizures. And they know how to take somebody and um, treat them if they're having a seizure. So you wouldn't want one group with five people in there who know about seizures. You would want to spread them evenly across the groups to make sure you don't have a biased group. When you randomly assign people, you're going to be much more likely to spread these five around instead of putting them all in the same group. And so that can help increase your internal validity when you are making sure that your participants are randomly distributed. Sometimes, you know, things happen and even with random distributing, you still have a little bit of bias, but you have to be, uh, you have to be aware that that can still exist. So when we, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> when we run statistics, and even, and this actually still applies uh, to correlation, and this applies to uh, um, lots of different kinds of statistics. We always look at something called the probability level or the p-value. Your p-value is going to tell you if the statistic that you run is statistically significant, if the difference or if the change is big enough to actually be due to either the manipulation or to the real true nature of the relationship. So this is something that you calculate after you've, you've gathered all of your statistics, okay? And this is a way for us to say, is this due to chance? Is this relationship due to chance? Or is this in fact due to really something that's happening? So what we want to see usually is that our p-value is less than a preset value. So in this case, a lot of times we go with 0.05. Now 0.05 is what we consider our alpha value. So we set this prior to the experiment. We say, okay, the level is 0.05. So we set this ahead of time and we say our alpha is 0.05. Then we gather all of our statistics, all of our data, then, then we you know, we do our statistics and this is our bar. And if our p-value is lower than our preset 0.05, then we say, okay, probability is less than five in 100 that the results are due to chance and not actually due to the independent variable. And so in this case, if our p is less than 0.05, let's say our p-value is 0 0.0025. That value is less than our preset alpha value of 0.05. Therefore, P is less than 0.05. So we can say that this relationship is in fact due to the independent variable. Now, <clears throat> you don't have to set your value, your alpha value at 0.05. Some people get really uh, fancy and they get really, you know, they really think there's going to be a good relationship there. So they might set the value lower. 0.05 is probably one of the higher, the highest levels. This is the the the, the biggest threshold um, where you're going to see a relationship that's probably there. Some people will set their alpha to 0.01. Some people will be like, no, I'm going to set my value to 0 0.001. But remember that when you set this this bar really, 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 really high. In this case, the bar is high um, because these values are so tiny. Your p value, okay got to be lower than that in order for you to say it's significant. That's why a lot of people stick to the 0.05 because they say, well, you know, this is a this is a good bar that's set and you're going to be more likely to find significance at this level than at this level and this level. Okay? So once you determine that your p-value is less than your alpha value, the bar has been set, 
you're, you matched it, you're good, then you can say that a relationship does in fact exist. And that relationship is probably not due to chance or to error or anything like that. So <clears throat> when we look at the limitations that we have with experimental studies, experimental studies are not perfect. No, none of them are going to be perfect. And to be honest with you, even a perfect study, there's problems with that, right? Okay, so there's no such thing as a perfect scenario. There's no such thing as a perfect experiment because being perfect in of itself is a problem because life is not perfect. There's, there's always something going on. Now, <clears throat> when we look at experimental situations, okay, sometimes people can argue that they can be artificial. You know, you're doing something in a lab. You're doing something in a situation where it doesn't feel real. The people know that they're participating in an experimental study. They know that some aspect of their behavior is being watched. And so a lot of times what ends up happening is that people will change their behavior because they don't feel like it's real enough. We also find, you know, this trade-off between being overly controlled and making sure that our trials and every time we redo the experiment with different groups of people that it remains the same or very similar across each situation and sometimes that's really really difficult to do so when we look at the Lotne and Darley experiment we could say well you know if you look at the original inspiration which is the Kitty Genovese murder this is very different the 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 uh, seizure studies are very different from the original inspiration. And also, does that mean that we can generalize that information? Can we generalize and say this is the same scenario and this is the reason why people act this way? The people who act in the seizure experiment versus the real life uh, event where it wasn't an experiment, it was Kitty Genovese's murder. Can we generalize the study results to the real life event? Are they too distant? Are are they just too like apples to oranges? You know, we have a case of a people in a lab in a college building doing an experiment, knowing they're in an experiment, versus you know a densely populated urban neighborhood at night. You know, knowing they're not part of experiment, knowing that you know they're at home, um, and also done at different times. You know, it, it, years later, so that can certainly be a, a limitation in an argument. So, how is it that we improve upon the external validity? And that is, how do we improve upon the fact that a study's results can be generalized to other situations, other groups of people? So there's two kinds of generalizability that we talk about. One is situational and one through people. So when we talk about um, a limitation with experimental research, a lot of times it's criticized for being too artificial. And so we try to make things realistic so that we can generalize across situations, which is saying, okay, this experimental situation, the results that we got from this is something that we would expect to happen <clears throat> in a real life situation. We also want it to generalize in terms of people. So we want to say, okay, the people who participated in this study, okay, um, that the way that they behaved would also be generalizable to other people in general, just different groups of people. And remember that a lot of times we go with what we call the convenient sample, the convenient sample, which is almost always college students because researchers have access to college students. And so we're much more likely to use them in experiments. And so this means that can we generalize the behavior of college students to everyone else, to people who are in um, you know, less educated areas, more educated areas, poorer areas, richer areas, uh, different cultures, different races, different ethnicities? Does this apply across different kinds of people? And so when we talk about this idea of 
generalizability across situations. There's two kinds of realism that we have to think about. The two kinds of realism where we're trying to say, are these situations generalizable in the lab to real life? And so we have this idea of mundane realism, which is how similar is this to a real life situation? How is this similar to uh, if we have a person who is in a college building, they're doing an experiment, and they hear a pre-recorded, they don't know it's pre-recorded, uh, emergency happening on their headset and have to determine if they're going to help versus a real-life situation where a person's in a building and somebody is having a seizure in another room and they hear an emergency happening. How real is that going from one situation to the next? That's what we refer to as mundane realism. Psychological realism is making sure and thinking about these psychological processes. Are you triggering the same kind of process in your experiment that you can expect to happen in a real life situation? Is it real enough in terms of the psychological response, the psychological process? It, are you convincing the person that it's an emergency and are you eliciting the same kind of reaction in that person that they're going to then react the same way as if it was a real life emergency? And then also in terms of generalizability across people, you want to make sure that's random. You have a group of people who are diverse in culture, in experience and education and you want to be able to be able to generalize the results of the study to other kinds of people and Latine and Darley did a lot of different experiments and, and then a lot of other experiments stemmed from their work to look at how people react in rural versus city situations and kinds of people who live in urban, rural set or, or rural settings. And so it turns out that people who are in more rural settings, who have been in the rural settings for a while, actually react very differently in emergency situations. They're more likely to get help than people who are in big cities. So for example, we're going to talk about this later in class, how people in big cities will actually walk over people who are passed out or who are um, ill or whatever, or they walk right by them, walk over them and continue on their way in big cities. Whereas if you see something very similar happen in an urban setting, a rural setting, excuse me, where there's not a lot of people around, where uh, the, the culture is a little bit different, we find that helping behavior changes pretty significantly. And so does this generalize across people? And we find that in a lot of these Latin and Darley experiments, it might not generalize to all kinds of cultures. And so it's important. And we'll talk about that just in a minute. Now, in order for us to know, is this generalizable? Is this universal? We've got to replicate. We've got to redo these studies. We redo them exactly the same to see if we can get the same results. And then we redo them using different situations and different kinds of people. If the people in every scenario react the same way in every experiment, in every condition, even when you change the groups of people, then we can say that that's actually universal, that everyone's going to act the same way. And we can generalize it to all kinds of people. But that's something that we have to be able to replicate and we have to be able to test across lots of of different kinds of people. Now, replication is very important for us to make sure that the results that we get are legitimate. Cross-cultural research really started taking off in about the 1980s, which is a little embarrassing because up until that point, a lot of the research has been done had been done on really um, richer white males because they were accessible in terms of college. And so a lot of experiments that were done earlier in, you know, what we refer to as quote unquote, you know, the generalizable population, the convenient sample was college students, but college students were not very diverse in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And so 
A lot of previous experiments uh, were done using a very uh, specific population, and that question is, is can we take that information and say, yes, we can translate that to everyone else. We can translate that to women. We can translate that to different ethnicities, different religions, different uh, socioeconomic statuses. And so the idea behind cross-cultural research is that we need to conduct research um, with members of different cultures and see if the results maintain the same. And if the results are the same across all cultures, then we can say that those results are universal. However, what we found is that in a lot of cases, we can see differences among cultures. And in that case, the results are not universal, but they are culturally specific. For example, you know, we can see that uh, Japanese culture can be very different than uh, American culture. So, for example, Japanese culture is what we refer to as sort of collectivist culture. And that can be very different in terms of the results that you find because they're much more family oriented and they are interested more in the group than the individual. And so there's been a lot of research uh, since the 1980s to look at these cultural differences. Now, one thing that we as researchers have to consider is that we don't have any kind of bias. And so we don't want we do not want um, bias in our research uh, because if we feel like our results are most important and only to you know specific in our culture and our culture is either better than or a model culture, then we can become ethnocentric and basically saying that we're biased uh, with our own culture, saying that it's you know our culture is the best culture. It is the culture that we should study. And so we need to guard against this bias and not be ethnocentric and make sure that we stem out and test different cultures in all of our studies that we do, especially in social psychology. We also have to consider that the independent and dependent variables may not be understood in the same way as different cultures. For example, with emotion expression, now, when we look at um, the universality of emotion, uh, basic emotion is something that we know is universal. So if we look at, you know, the basic emotions like happiness, you know, happy, sad, um, scared or frightened, uh, <clears throat> all of these, you know, very basic emotions we find are very universal. Everyone in the world uh, regardless if they're in a collectivist culture, a more you know individualistic culture, if they are um, uh, in any part of the world, even parts of the world where they have no exposure. So, like if there's a particular tribe in a you know very remote part of the world that's never been exposed to other people, they still express emotion the same way. These basic emotions. Smiling for happiness, frowning for sadness. It's something you do not need to be taught. It's something that you're born immediately knowing how to do. And so we know that this is actually universal. And so this, we know that this is universal because it's been tested in many different cultures. Over 50 cultures has been tested in, and it's been tested in those specific tribes who have not had Western influence. The ones that are, you know, kind of remote and have never really been exposed to other people are, those people are still able to express emotion the same way. Uh, children who are born blind uh, babies who are born blind and can't see emotions still smile when they're happy and frown when they're sad. And so we know that this is universal. However, it turns out that, so not only is it universal that people uh, can express and recognize emotion and not only their cultural group, but any human face, there are some, uh, uh, the way that we, uh, express complex emotion and the social the social rules the cultural rules are specific to cultures and so we know that complex emotion 
and we know that uh, the rules of what we're allowed to express vary different across cultures. So that's something that is important to consider that, excuse me, that um, are different and require cross-cultural research for us to be able to determine for sure what's universal, what isn't, does this apply to everybody? Now, how is it that we can improve external validity? So <clears throat> one thing that we can do is something called a field experiment. And so field experiments are one of the best ways to increase external validity, um, making it realistic, making it apply, right? So in a field experiment, a researcher would study behavior outside of the lab in its natural setting. And so this idea is using you know, not a lab with controlled, you know, in a college building um, with people with uh, lab coats and all that. It's actually using real life settings. For example, outside a store, a street, a campus, a sidewalk. And the participants who are around actually do not even know that they're in an experiment. And so this becomes um, this this in turn creates a really high external validity because it's actually taking place in the real world. So, for example, Latne and Darley did an experiment where they had uh, um, Confederates or who are people who are a part of the experiment pretend to rob a, a store, a convenience store, and so they were testing the bystander effect to see uh, um, how many people would get help or, 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 you know, do something about it. And so the people, the bystanders were not, uh, they did not know that they were a part of an experiment. They didn't know that the situation was fake. They were just going into the convenience store and then now all of a sudden the convenience store is being robbed. And so, um, th there's a lot of, of, questionability here. We're going to talk about ethics in just a minute and informed consent. But the idea is, is that the external validity is very high, but it's a trade-off. The internal validity is low, lower because we don't, we can't control certain things, right? So <clears throat> when we increase the external validity, we lose a bit of internal validity or control. We can't control who is in the convenience store as our participants because it's chance of whoever's there. We can't control a lot of extraneous variables to say that for sure our independent variable is causing what's going on. When we in when we increase internal validity, okay, um, so we control more things in the lab, we lose a bit of that generalizability or external validity. And so it becomes less real. So it's always a trade-off. And the idea is, is that you have to consider what am I willing to trade? right? What am I willing to trade off? Am I losing control to get the setting more real? Am I creating better control, but I'm losing generalizability um, and realism? Um, so what is, you know, what are you willing to, to sacrifice? And a lot of times it's just simply um, a balance. It's the, you're going to lose some either way. And so one way that you can get around this, of course, is to do multiple different kinds of experiments. So you're losing some, <coughs> excuse me, internal validity uh, by doing a field experiment. Well, then you counter that by doing an in-lab experiment while you're losing a little external validity. And so you do both field and lab studies. You try to replicate different settings, different kinds of people, and you're uh, putting all of the information that you get together and you replicate and you repeat these studies in order for you to be able to um, say that the results across all of these different studies show us this. We can generalize across different settings. We can generalize across different people. We have external validity in some cases, good internal validity in other cases. But you put everything together because you cannot do it all in one experiment. You put everything together over the course of several uh, experiments. And then now you've got a really solid explanation for bystander behavior. 
So when we look at the kinds of research that we do in, in not only social psychology, but psychology in general and other site stuff, is we have basic research and we have applied research. So basic research is just basic questions about human behavior. We do this kind of research because we're curious. And so uh, sometimes the line between basic research and applied research and social psychology is a little bit blurry. Um, but you know, a really common kind of basic research experiment would be sort of more neurological research. You've got, you know, rice, uh, right, uh, mice and rats and you're, you know, opening up the brain and you're, you know, uh, looking at a particular neuron or you're looking at a particular process or a particular metabolic process. And you're just, you're wanting to know more about that. So that's a, a really clear cut example of basic research, but in social psychology, it's a little bit blurrier and, the applied studies is where we're actually trying to solve social problems and we're trying to understand uh, particular um, uh, behaviors and how do we kind of apply that to the real world settings. And again, this is just something that uh, that is done a lot of times in social psychology, whereas we might be something that is um, uh, generalizable. Uh, it may may or may not be obvious with the experiment that you're doing. And so in order to solve social problems, though, we have to understand a lot of these underlying psychological dynamics. And that's what we get with the results from basic research. And so it is important to do both so that we have information from both. And so kind of going back to this idea of ethical guidelines, when we're doing experimental work, we need to make sure that the work is ethical. So the to have both external and internal validity, our experiment must be well controlled and it must resemble the real world as possible. But we also do not want to cause our participants undue, unnecessary stress, discomfort, unpleasantness, or trauma. But when these two goals conflict, we get ethical dilemmas. We want to create a real life experiment that looks real, feels real, but we don't want to cause trauma in our participants. So what do we do? Well, we have to rely on the institutional review board of the institution, the IRB, which is the ethics board, who is the, that they are the individuals It's made up of at least five individuals and they vary in terms of their backgrounds. Um, you have to have unaffiliated people. You have to have people, you know, from the, 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 the sort of the public, the community, and they all check to make sure that every study that's done with that at that institution is ethically sound. They aren't looking at your protocols, making sure that it's sound research and your methods are good. All they're interested in is, are participants going to be harmed? Is there risk? And if there is risk, if is the benefit of what you're going to learn more important or higher rated ranked than the risk involved? And so they determine if your research is actually ethical. So there are times where you can do some things that might be slightly harming um, or uh, you might lie to your participant, okay? Um, but the case is, is that the the risk and benefit ratio, so you're always looking at the risk-benefit um, ratio, you've got to have a higher benefit than the risk in order for that particular piece of research to be uh, approved. And so before you can do anything in your study, before you can talk to people, contact people, recruit people, whatever, it's got to be approved by the IRB. It's got to be approved first. During the process, uh, once you're approved, of course, you need to obtain informed consent. And so the participants that you have you need to explain the study to them. They need to understand the details in the experiment um, in order to be able to say, I understand I'm informed and I agree or consent to the study. If you think about it, it's more of like a social contract, but know that the participants must understand that they can quit at any time and they're not going to get any sort of repercussions from quitting. So there's this balance, though, of like, uh, 
explaining to the participant about the study, but you also need to maintain the integrity of the study. If you are trying to uh, explain the study, but if you explain too much, you're going to give away your hypothesis, you're going to change their behavior because of expectation, then in some cases you might actually have to deceive the person or lie to them. Or at least you're telling them only the bare minimum of the study, just enough so that they understand the basics and they know enough to say, I want to participate. You should definitely not leave anything out that might actually influence their participation. So for example, let's say the risk is them dying, right? You can't say, oh, well, you know, there's some risk involved and then breeze over that. If the risk is them dying, they need to know that because it's probably going to change their likelihood if they're actually going to consent. And the idea of informed consent is they have to understand it enough to, to determine if they want to participate or not. In cases where we have to use deception, where we say, oh, well, we're looking at this behavior and you're sort of lying to them because you're actually looking at something else. And if you told them that you're looking at the something else, then that would influence their behavior and, and impact your results. If the IRB determines that it's acceptable for you to lie to them, what you do is you lie to them about the study purpose, but then after the fact, you debrief them and explain why you lied. And, it, and then you also want to... Um, apologize and explain why you did it and, and, and why it was important that you did it. Now, deception does conflict with informed consent. It absolutely does. And so you have to consider this and the IRB has to consider this. Is it necessary? And if it's deemed as necessary and there's no other way around it, then you can do it um, in some cases. And so you want to make sure that you're not causing harm, but you also need to make sure that the participant is gaining benefit, right? Or some benefit is being gained. And you wanna make sure that the participant has a pleasant experiment, uh, experience. Because if you create a, a very bad experience for the participant, they become very untrusting in research, they don't wanna participate again, and they might, as consumers later on, totally uh, disregard results from studies because they had that bad experience. So you want to do the best that you can. And a lot of it's just a very delicate balance. And sometimes there's no good, right or wrong answer with some of these ethical dilemmas. It's just a matter of, you know, what, what do we think is best for the participant? Um, but a lot of times in a lot of social psychology experiments, we do see that some uh, psychological trauma might actually be possible, but we just need to make sure that we do the best that we can to uh, help the person afterward and explain the reason why we did that. So this last slide is just a way for you to kind of go through and help you with your studying. If you have any questions about this chapter, please feel free to email me. And if you have any questions in general, of course, I'm always available. And so I hope you have a wonderful day. And thank you for your attention.